Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this conversation with film producer Michael Simkin, the fourth event in Ivy Film Festival's weekend of career chats with leaders in the film industry. I'm Sasha Pinto, a senior here at Brown and one of the directors of the Ivy Film Festival. And before we welcome Michael to the Zoom stage, it's my great pleasure to tell you a little bit about him. So Michael has been involved in movie making and television for nearly 20 years. He attended USC Film School and during his first ever job after graduation, he met Zac Efron on a set. I mean, what luck, right? And I'll let him tell you that story. But the bottom line is that they hit it off and ended up founding a production company together called Ninjas Runnin' Wild. And well, the rest is history. Through the Ninjas banner, Michael and Zach have produced a number of great films, including the fun film Dirty Grandpa with Robert De Niro, which Michael jokes lost to Hillary's America for the worst picture of the year award. But then, of course, there was that blockbuster hit, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile, where Zach chillingly channels serial killer Ted Bundy, which opened to great fanfare and won numerous awards. Michael has also produced an animated Facebook series with Zach called Human Discoveries, featuring an amazing lineup of stars like Anna Kendrick and Lisa Kudrow, as well as the documentary The Great Global Cleanup on the Discovery Channel that spotlights climate activities. But my personal favorite is the terrific travel series for Netflix called Down to Earth, where Zach and superfoods guru Darren Olean explore how different cultures around the world are living healthy, eco-conscious lives. Um, in fact, when they filmed in New York City, I was a beekeeper on the set, which is how I had the great good fortune of meeting Zach and Michael. And at the time, I was holding frames of some 10,000 slightly annoyed Italian honeybees and not wearing any protective gear, no beekeeper's veil or jacket, because of course, I had to look cool for Zac Efron. So after a few bee stings, uh, suffice it to say, it was an exhilarating experience in every way. And since that fateful day, Michael and I have stayed in contact and he's become a good friend to Ivy Film Festival and even flew from his home in California to join us as a speaker at our 2018 festival, bringing an advanced screening of Extremely Wicked to the Brown community to preview, which was pretty special. So with that, Please join me in welcoming back our wonderful friend, Mr. Michael Simpkin. Hello, Michael. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Michael, I think you're muted if you just unmute yourself. Perfect. How are you? Hey. <laughs> I, I didn't know pushing those buttons was going to be so hard, but it's it's hard to time that. It's, but uh, thanks for the great intro. And you are a great you, beekeeper. How are you doing today? Thank you. Thank doing you. Doing pretty well. How are you? Very well, but let me start by saying how incredibly generous it is of you to join us again at Brown and share your experiences and expertise. We are so grateful. Thank you. It's, it's the closest I've been to going to an Ivy League school, so uh, I'll take it. <laughs> no, you're an honorary Brown student. Thank now, you very much. Brown professor. But um, tell us, how have you been spending your months in quarantine? Have you been filming or working on any projects? Uh, you know, so it's crazy how long it's been. Uh, since quarantine began, but uh, a lot. I mean, on the family front, I have three kids, so uh, there's a lot to figure out there on the schooling, but also um, the uh, Down to Earth came out in July. So it was a nice, it, it, we were finishing it really when this started. I mean, we were, we were finished with post, but there's still a ton to do. It's probably the best time um, to be able to work mobily in the process because it's mostly approvals and, um, you know, and just kind of tying everything up before the end. But so that was exciting to come out. And I think, you know, I, I it really it connected with a lot of people, I think, because um, it was a travel show when when people couldn't travel. So um, in that way, um, that was nice. But, you know, it's a grind. And I'm sure like everybody else, it's you're eager to, to keep going, but also trying to stay busy. And so it's been that. But but as content is being consumed at such a huge level um, at home, people are still buying, there's still a lot to do and, and everybody's preparing for what they're gonna make as quickly as possible once they can. So some productions have started back up. Um, I think I'll be back, back in action in January, but, um, but yeah, it's been, uh, it's, been, it's been busy. It's very on and off. Yeah, yeah. And I bet your kids loved having you at home all this time too. 
Yes. I, they don't always show it, but I think so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, getting right down to business because I know everyone in the audience is excited to hear about your career as a film producer and figure out how they too can break into the industry. So let's start at the beginning. Um, why don't you tell us how you got interested in the film industry and what was your concentration in college? Yeah, so, um, you know, when I went to, I, I went to USC, I was undeclared at the time. I, I thought I actually wanted to uh, major in composition for mu music to do film scores for for movies and um, I took some general film classes and I started working I'm Canadian originally so I'd go live with my grandma and my aunt in Winnipeg um, and that was right around the time that SARS hit so a bunch of productions right. moved from Toronto which was like the New York of Canada to Winnipeg which uh, you know is will always be my New York but it, <laughs> but it was definitely not uh, not the hot spot until until that point right. and so um you know i got to go there and work on a set i worked on a movie called shall we dance um with uh my best friend now nathan fields who was the only other person from america working in the locations department which is which is pretty much you know cleaning tables and moving stuff for people and um but what it gets you is you're there all day and and you're seeing what's going on and um, I really, I fell in love with it, every aspect of it from, from the creative side, which I wasn't really, you know, seeing much of, but, but just the magic of, I, I remember one day it was my job to watch the door. Like I literally just had to stand in front of the door and make sure nobody walked in during the scene. Oh. And um, Susan Sarandon was doing a scene with Richard Gere where she was yelling at him. And I was like, I just couldn't believe how real it sounded. And and like, well, this is real acting, you know, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing it. And it was, it was so exciting. It just, everything about it was so magical. To, so when I came back from that, I already had kind of, I think by that point I had switched over to film. Um, I don't know if I was officially in the program yet, but later I was, but I, at that point I realized it was just, I, I loved it and there was just something magical about it. Yeah, absolutely. And after you graduated, what was your first job in the industry? And can we learn anything by how you actually landed that job? Yeah, so it really goes back to what I was doing during college because um, when I when I worked on Shall We Dance, and, and I think that was my junior year in college or sophomore, I can't remember. And then I, I went back and worked on some Christmas TV movies and stuff. <laughs> But what I ended up doing was I, I didn't really know anybody before that in the in the film industry. So it ended up um, I ended up meeting a lot of people that are still friends. Um, but also uh, every job has kind of come directly from that. So my friend Nathan, whose dad was um, the uh, was producing that movie, I didn't know before. And um, and after we met, um, when I graduated. I called him and he was helping me find a job and he actually ended up hiring someone um, that worked. He needs someone a little more experienced than me, but he hired someone and then that person had to replace themselves at their old job. So because they knew that they connected me and that job was for um, Jennifer Gibgott and Adam Shankman and Matthew Mizell, who were producers of the company called Offspring, who mm -hmm. did at that time step up and hairspray, but ultimately, um, Jennifer Gibgott, who's just incredible at spotting talent. When High School Musical came around, she said, I'm gonna find Zach's uh, first non-High School Musical movie. And uh, they found 17 again. So that's actually was the beginning. Every job has directly come out of that, that summer, um, that summer uh, working on Shall We Dance. Wow. So that's... thank you to Nathan and, <laughs> and uh, yeah. <laughs> That is such an interesting trajectory. And that first summer job on Shall We Dance, how did you actually get it? What Was it hard to get? That's a great question. So I, I actually lied when I said I didn't know anybody in the entertainment industry. My cousin, who I'm not like a, like a third or fourth cousin, um, was an entertainment lawyer in Canada, who I didn't really know that well, but I reached out, my, my mom probably reached out and I reached out to him and he put me in contact with, eventually I ended up getting in contact with the location manager. And I remember taking this call at my parents' house in San Diego and just being like very nervous. And, and when I got on, I was, I was, it was the truth. I was really like, I just want to be around. I don't care if, I, if, I'm, if I'm cleaning or what I'm doing. I just want to learn. I'm still in college. And um, 
you know, I got lucky because I, I had access to that phone call and also because I had Canadian citizenship. They thought it was a little bit crazy uh, mm -hmm. that I was going to fly out there for this uh, for this pretty low job. But, you know, right. I, I knew I just wanted to be around it. And so I think my advice would be two things. First off, you know, try to see who you know that you can just reach out to. It's not about it's not necessarily about connections. It's it's trying to find out like obviously we met just very randomly. There's yeah. a lot of people um, that I've met very randomly that that I stay in contact with or or that just reach out. And if there's companies or people that um, you really like what they're doing and their work, uh, it's not that hard to to find an email or to find something on a, and it. And it never hurts to to reach out and just uh, tell a little bit about yourself. And I think people assume that that we're getting those kinds of things all the time and we are to a degree, but what we're not getting all the time, I would say, is 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 really well thought out responses or people who who are reaching out for a specific reason, because if somebody emails you and they just say, oh, I want a job and we get these sometimes like, oh, I love yeah. Zach, I want a job like there's nothing that compelling about that. But if they reach out and and there's a really specific something inspired them or they have a strong opinion on something or they've been following the work, um, you know, I, I to at least tend to respond to those kind of things. And I think a lot of people do because um, most of us had somebody that did that for us. And I hopefully most people remember it, some don't. But the reality is that, that I love that aspect of it um, because there's a lot of people that are out there um, and better at a lot of things than I am. So it's, uh, you know, it's exciting to find those people. And one of our producers on our show, um, who's now a supervising producer um, and just amazing, I met her four years ago. She, she just randomly reached out about being Zach's assistant and it didn't work out at that time, but I remembered her. And, and you know, now she's, she's fully producing because yeah. she was totally capable. So. It's really, uh, yeah, I, I would say, don't be shy. Um, don't necessarily be aggressive, but I think it, it's follow the, follow your passion. Like, you know, if, if you're, if you're interested in something specific, like tell us why, you know, tell us yeah. what it is about it. Because I think that that's a way of showing um, what you bring to the table too. Because if, if, if the way you view something is really is re it's really telling about about your capabilities also you know so yeah. i always would encourage people to even if it's just i really enjoyed this you know i'm a, i'm a college student i'm finishing in a year but like this was really inspirational to me or something like that when it's genuine and and it's it's pretty powerful to me yeah. at least yeah that's that's terrific advice um and and how did you meet zach and why did you two come up with the idea of starting a production company together so i actually cannot claim uh credit for starting the production company even though i was there um i wasn't i wasn't part of the initial production company team but so zach and i met um i jennifer gibgott came through on her word and she found 17 again and I remember the first time I ever met Zach, I was an assistant to like, um, you know, a producer who wasn't the main producer on that show. And I remember him walking in. And when High School Musical came out, the DVD just like circulated around Disney. That, that production company had a first look deal with Disney at the time. So it was just like overnight, nobody knew what it was. And the next day it was like, everybody at Disney was talking about it. Yeah. So when he came in, I, he just seemed like a super nice guy. Like, you know, just said hi to him and that was it. But when the director, Burr Steers, um, came in, he started working out of our offices and he and I became really close and he's a mentor in so many ways. I learned, I learned so, that was, I say that was like, that was my real college um, in a lot of ways. And so I learned so much from him and um, we hit it off. So when he, he didn't have a director's assistant because uh, he directed a movie called Igby Goes Down, which is awesome if you haven't seen it. Um, and, and he was supervising the rewrites. So he was around all the time. And so I just did exactly what I'm talking about. I told him, I, I love this. And, you know, I've learned so much from you and I'd love to come work with you. And um, thankfully he brought me on. So I was in an amazing position because the producer I had just worked for and the director um, I had known for a while. So I definitely, 
uh, probably stepped out of my lane a little bit at the time, but yeah. it was a great experience because I had these people that, that included me in everything. And, and um, that was so special. So he actually ended up doing that and Charlie St. Cloud with Zach. So I got to know Zach as the director's assistant. And then after those two movies, when you're working for a director, a lot of the time you're just freelance project to project. So the next one wasn't lined up yet. And, um, and Zach uh, was gonna go do the lucky one. So, uh, and his assistant, this kind of stuff happens all the time, but his assistant went to the UK to do some big movie uh, when they were doing tons of stuff out there. And they called me and said, can you, you know, would you wanna do this? And I said, absolutely. And I told them what my ultimate aspirations were. And at the time, they were at that time they were just starting the company and they ended up bringing in someone else to run the company jason young who was also a mentor an amazing guy and now an executive at, he, he came from fox went back to fox and now is an executive at netflix who yeah. i have uh, a few projects with and just yeah so it's it was amazing to to be working with the same people and burr too looks like he's coming back uh to work on some something together so you know all these things and Jennifer Gibgott actually I'm working with right now too so everything comes back but yeah I, I started there and um, Jason ran the company for a while did an amazing job and then had a, a great opportunity to go um, back to Fox in a higher position than he was at before and ultimately Netflix so at that point I, I said um, you know can I can I have a chance and luckily we had we had a good enough relationship at that point and um, you know the timing was just right and it ended up growing and and um, yeah, becoming, yeah. Uh, it took a while. It is, it's tough, a, a talent, you know, it, it's always a balance for talent uh, production companies because you want to be taken seriously as producers, right. um, but you have to prove yourself because your main value at that point is, you, you know, is your is the talent. So, um, so it's, it, but it's nice too, because I feel like it, there's a strong motivation to like over deliver and to, provide great value and, and prove yourself so um that it that part of it's fun and you get opportunities that that uh you know you probably that you wouldn't get without without a piece of a-list talent so i'm always grateful and aware of that and you know it, that's that's important because it, it opens up doors at earlier levels than than if you were just starting out producing without a piece of talent yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It actually ties into my next question, which is, can you walk us through the role of the producer, including the different types of production companies, as well as the different types of producers, like line producers versus producers who focus on writing or finances. And then there's television producers and showrunners. So maybe you can just clarify the types of production jobs out there that students might want to think about. Absolutely. So I definitely can't hit them all because there's so many, but I would look at it I mean, it's a very vague term. So most of the, as a general rule, a producer for, um, for a movie is, and there can be a lot of them, but a reg, regular just producer title is um, the most hands-on one or, or somebody who's been very involved in the project for a long time or owns it, or it can even be um, a director is also the producer. So I'd say that's, um, typical for film for tv it's the opposite the executive producer is is typically the highest uh producing position same thing an executive producer can be um a showrunner an executive producer could be the creator or the writer um executive producer could be the talent who also produces like zach's in the movies but he also um serves as a producer and yeah. and so he's giving notes and weighing in and and um making calls and, and doing all the producer stuff um, so it's really, it is a separate title that, that, that's earned, you know, that, that he works for separately. So, um, then you have a line producer, line producer is basically, I would say the logistics side. So money and, and figuring out doing all the hiring. Um, so normally the director will hire the department heads, but the line producer is guiding that whole process, putting together a crew, um, with the director and with their team. Um, and very focused on all the non-creative challenges. A great line producer um, understands and cares about creative very strongly too, because you know they're they're in a very difficult position because they're often responsible. If it's a financier or a studio, they're responsible to to protect that money 
and to make sure that production's running in a responsible and efficient way and the movie gets finished and you know and that that's at odds with with creative a lot of times it doesn't have to be though great right. i've worked with a lot of I, pretty much every line producer i've worked with i I've, I've really loved mm -hmm. and all of them have been great because they understand um they understand how those things work together same goes for a director a director that doesn't understand or care about um the financial ramifications is probably not serving themselves well you get to a point if you're if if you're a big enough director and a strong enough visionary where you've kind of earned the right to say, I'm gonna do what I want and you figure it out. And, and there's a lot of people where I think that's, that's reasonable and that's what you sign up for. Mm -hmm. um, but the more that you're communicating and working through these things, the better. So, um, so yeah, I would say, and, and line producers can also be full producers or executive producers. There are a lot of, as they get more experience, there's, there's huge line producers also who are amazing at what they do even who crop, end up crossing more over into the creative side. So there's no, you can get there a lot of different ways. Most, most line producers come up the assistant director route or um, you know production management or accountant um, route, but there's no rules for these kind of things. And like I said, I think the best people at these jobs often are people who, who there's some crossover and they understand both sides of it. And so, um, yeah, it's a very, the, the title can really mean anything. And then for a movie, like executive producer could be anything from somebody who found the source material and then just gave it to somebody else who like, or, or originally had, uh, the rights to it, or, you know, it could be whoever controls the estate. It could be a lot of different things. Um, so it's tough to look at a title without research and know exactly what yeah. that person did. Um, good or bad and then you have other kind you have associate producers co-producers which are all different ways normally of, of people working themselves working their way up in between so like I said with Laura like you know she she started as um, as a researcher and stuff on season one and worked her way up to a producer on season one and then um, you know hopefully if we do season two um, she'll be a supervising producer and so it just you just grow on your titles um and you kind of just get them by doing them for the first time I, I show ran um season one for the first time uh, myself and a showrunner is basically so in tv uh, it's kind of the creative voice so there you can have directors in in tv um and it's a little bit of a different job because if you come in to direct like season seven of Grey's anatomy like episode three like you're not you're not yeah. coaching people on their accents and, and <laughs> like and, you know and, and changing wardrobe and stuff it's still incredibly important and difficult job right. but um but the showrunner is is typically the consistent voice that that is that is making those big decisions and guiding the writer's room and guiding kind of these big character choices so the answer is there's so many different combinations but that's a general right. rule i would say yeah that's yeah that's perfect and now relating all of this to what you do can you tell us about a typical day for you if such a thing exists or a typical week maybe describe a normal day in the office versus a normal day on set so i am a, a very add individual uh so i don't i don't spend a lot of time in an office and when i do i have to be very uh like constantly engaged um but i would say so everything's kind of divided into different categories for what a day looks like. So um, typically when we're not, when we're not in prep production or post-production, then we're in essentially like development or looking for ideas. So at that point it's reading scripts that come in. Um, it's coming up with ideas and, and figuring out wh what's the best way to make them real. Do we, if it's scripted, do we bring in a writer? So I'm working on a project right now um, where somebody brought us an idea that we really liked and, and he's going to direct it. He's an actor and director. Um, and it was a really funny idea. So we'll, we'll start there and he didn't want to fully write it, but we wanted to find a partner to, to write like a writer. So, right. so for the last three or four weeks, you call agents and you kind of soft pitch the idea to writers that you think are cool. And then they bring you back ideas and then you narrow down that list. And once you get the writer you want, you turn that into a pitch and then you, that's what you'll take out. 
So it's like three or four weeks to figure out, to basically build the package um, and, then, and then bring that out. So that's development is something we're always doing. Um, other things, you know, something comes into us that's sometimes really close to going, sometimes is already in pre-production or sometimes it's just like a very small idea, like the beginnings of an idea. Wow. Um, and we have to figure out which ones, how you're going to manage your time, which ones you think you're, a big thing for us is it's a two way thing. Like obviously it has to be something we believe is gonna work up, but it also has to be something that we believe we're gonna be a value add to because there's nothing worse than kind of signing on and disappointing people or, or having something that you don't really know what to do with and you're not helping, like it's not a good feeling. So it, it's evaluating that. So that's kind of when you're not in production. That continues when you're in production too, but it slows down a bit and, and you know, you kind of, I try to really focus on whatever we're doing if we're in production. So pre-production um, is kind of my favorite part of any process. Uh, it's, it's when for a movie, you know, you'll start prep and then you'll normally head out to, to location um, a couple months before, start finding where you're gonna shoot all these scenes and hiring your department heads and, and casting and uh, working on the script and figuring out how you're gonna get the budget to where it needs to be. So it's really just different problem solving every single day. And I love that. I love the scheduling aspect. I mean, that's another thing that the line producer and the production managers and that team is, yeah. it, is way better at than I am, but, but it's fun. It's, it's a giant puzzle and it's fun. You know, somebody, somebody all of a sudden is out for a week and you have to figure out how you're going to move the scenes around and, and make things work. So pre-production is just constant problem solving for a show like down to earth. It's a little bit different because we're doing all of our prep here and then you're heading out to the location with a lot less time. So it's finding all the experts, finding the storylines. I mean, you don't, you don't have control over the storylines because you want it to be as natural as possible, but you have a general idea of, of what your trip's gonna look like. And then, and then you make adjustments as you go. And the more prepared you are going in, the easier it is to pivot if something's not working or if something's working better than you expect then you wanna follow that. Yeah. Um, then production, in a way, if you've done good prep, I don't wanna say it's the easiest part because you're still, you, there's still tons of problems, but my job, at that point um, for a movie really becomes supporting the director as much as I can, helping um, helping with the studio or the financier if there's anything they're concerned about and really keeping everything flowing as smoothly as possible. So it's the same thing, it's like a firefighter at that point, you know, it's just putting out fires and, and doing the best that you can to not, um, to, to not let let things get derailed and th there's always issues and um and, and they're real i mean it's sometimes sometimes it might be something that affects one department more than everybody else so they're very worried but it's really about hearing and and communicating with everybody and and just helping ease that um on a show if i'm show running then it's it's balancing that um but i i luckily have great producers there that help that help do that for me and then it's and then it's following the creative, you know, making a, on a show like Down to Earth. It's really making adjustments on the fly, um, starting to try to visualize what the end product's going to look like. So, um, talking to your editor or, or or taking notes or you know figuring trying to figure it out because you're really just it, it's coming together before your eyes, you know, and you're you're trying to figure out what that is. And then post is also really fun. I mean, that's where you're managing a lot at the beginning it's really just editorial and, and figuring it out but then then you have to get it you get into sound and you get into music and you get into um color correction and all all the stuff that makes a final product so yeah. the answer is it's it's kind of the same rotation of things but it's different every time yeah that's that's so interesting and it sounds like such a fun job too but it I is very fun I know you studied film in school. So tell us how important you think it is to have a degree in film or attend graduate school for film production. I know that Columbia, for example, has a three-year film production program. That's pretty impressive sounding. Yeah, so I think, I think film school, there's a lot of things it can do and there's a lot of things it can't do. I mean, one thing that it does, especially if you go to a school like Columbia or USC or NYU, or, or there's so many more, you know, there's so many good ones now. Um, is you're meeting other people that are really going to be in the industry and that are incredibly talented and the next generation of people. So 
there's a lot of value in learning with those people, finding there's a lot of partnerships like um, I think Brian Grazer and um, and um, and Ron, <laughs> Ron Howard met in, at USC. And there's a lot of things like that where people connect and they end up working together and building amazing careers together because it's a great time to explore your own creativity. So in that way, that's that's one of the reasons why I the biggest value I think is that it's a, it's a bit of a low, it's hopefully low stress, low pressure environment to find out what aspects of the industry you like, um, what who you are as a storyteller, you know, and and be able to write, have time to write, and even though you're you're very busy with schoolwork, hopefully that work is stuff that has value, like writing scripts and learning how to do that stuff. So. I think it's incredibly important from that, from a networking standpoint of not just like meeting people that are already in the industry or professors who can help guide and things like that, but also really like the future of the industry. I mean, everybody, a lot of people are coming out every year from all different places. So you're meeting, you know, possibly partners for life. What it won't teach you is the practical side. But I think I would imagine, I'm not a lawyer, but I would imagine it's the same for law school or for medical school too. You can learn a ton of information but there's a reason why you have to do a residency or you know why you work your way up because nobody can teach you practical skills because it's different every time. But the more knowledge you have and experience you have, even on a student film set, um, you know, or working low level positions or things like that, the more, the bigger tool kit you have right. for problems. Yeah. So I would say if it's not an option for you financially or it's not an option for you you know, you don't get in where you want to go. I, it's definitely not the end of the road. Then I would, I would say, lean into the practical side. You know, try to find any job you can in the industry and and learn that way. And that's absolutely a totally viable way of doing it. Um, if you do have that luxury and you do um, want to go that path, then then maximize it. You know, really try to it, it's it's really fun i mean my parents make fun of the fact that i watched movies for four years at usc but it, but it it really is fun and it should be fun because that's where you know this isn't rocket science at the end of the day it's 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 passion and i think it's it's really just finding what you want to be and so i i think in that way of just growing up um and and learning it's, it's important but i wouldn't say if you don't go to film school, you can't work in film. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and, and the last time you spoke at IFF, we talked about how the industry was changing and whether feature films were going to be obsolete and whether we should be making short or long forms or more content for phones, et cetera. And now given COVID-19, of course, that's such a loaded question, but what are your thoughts on how the industry is changing today? I mean, it's it's changing at such a crazy pace right now that I don't think anybody can keep up. I mean, just from the economic challenges that theaters are going to face, I, I think most people would agree. We all hope that that they stay and and survive and thrive. And and there's nothing like a theatrical experience. It's incredibly um, important, I think, for communities and also just it, it's it's like nothing else. So I hope and believe there will always be some form of theatrical. Um, and, and I don't think that's gonna change, but I do I do think now financially, um, streaming is a viable option. And for a lot, especially during COVID, um, you know, people need content and, and they're consuming it at a massive rate at home. Right. So in a way that's a very good thing because I, a lot of, a lot of networks and, and streamers are buying a lot because they're, they're, they need to, they need content. Um, but ultimately I think the consumer will determine whether or not theaters come back. So I hope once that becomes a possibility, people choose to go back out and, and support them because I think it's an important part of the industry. And I think that um, it's, it would be really unfortunate if that's an experience that, um, you know, we don't have for a while. I also think there's going to be, I'm sure, innovation in what it what it is to go to the theaters. I don't know what it will be, but 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 I would think just like everything else, that experience will evolve. And um, it's been around for a long time, so I feel like like the communal experience will find a way to survive. But it's definitely changing in terms of content. You know, 
as as silly as this sounds, I think when you're making when you're making content as a as a student or as an indie film or anything like that, I mean, the story should tell you what it needs to be, not the other way around. So like, you know, I would I would if you have a story that that is great as a short, don't try to turn it into a feature just because you think maybe more people will want it. Nail that short. And I promise you, if if that short's amazing and it's well received, people will reach out and the first question they'll ask is what else do you have? Or they'll help you turn that into there's a lot of things, especially in the horror genre, but lot but in a lot of genres that started as um, somebody short film and and somebody uh, a production company or or a studio or someone sees that and they're really impressed by it and and they will figure out a way um, to work with you and 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 to help so tell the best story you can whatever length it is um, but but the other thing too is keep as much as you can keep keep writing because I promise you the next question is always what else do you have and if you have something that is a short but doesn't really translate to anything else, but it's opening up these doors, you're gonna have all these open doors and they're gonna to wanna to know what you wanna work on next. So it doesn't necessarily mean you have to have 50 scripts, but but just have an idea of where you're going and 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 what you wanna do and, and just have ideas really. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and pulling it all together, can you walk us through some tangible steps that students can take right now to break into the production industry? Well, the most tangible step anybody can do is that we can do now that didn't exist, you know, 50 years ago is create, you know, if you want to, if you want to be a writer, you need to write, you don't need to write well right now, but you need to write and you need to grow as a writer. You also need to read, you know, if you want to make movies or you want to make shows, watch movies and shows like, you know, and, and, and a wide variety of them. Try to watch things that maybe not are not things you typically want to watch because you never know what's going to inspire you or or where you're going to find ideas. Um, you know, make make short films or if you are in school, really take your student film project seriously. Um, and the same goes for other departments. If you're in film school, one of the great things about it is you get the opportunity. Those projects still do have a first AD, and those projects still do have a casting director. So even if you're not doing it paid, you have the opportunity to really learn and, and, and make an impact. Like you, there are people who have found real talent and who have produced like amazing projects that led to real tangible things out of film school. Even if that project itself doesn't get bought um, or turn into anything you have, you're working on, it is a real set. You are making real projects. So I think there's this, and I remember feeling it too, there's almost this, what can I do and, and what does it look like? And the reality is right now, there's no excuse why anybody can't make something. Regardless, of, even if it's just practice and you don't like the way it comes out and you don't do much with it, you can, you can try and you can do that. And then on the other side, what I said earlier, you know, reach out to people if there's people you wanna learn from. Um, try to, if you see a project that that's meaningful to you, look up who is involved with it. Look up those production companies. Start to start to recognize um, if there's patterns of of directors, or even if you want to get into production design, like and you're watching movies, look up who the production designer was. Watch their other movies. Try to understand um, what makes them great. So I think you that's something we all have access to so much material now. No matter what, if you're if you're into composing, listen to film scores. When you're moved by something, look that person up and 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 see because you start to get an understanding. You can also look at someone else's trajectory. Like look at the projects they did and how their career, what their career path was. Not because you have to follow it, but just to understand. Like you'd be shocked if you look at some of these people. Don't just come in and the first thing they do most of the time is some massive movie you've heard of. They have a path. Yeah. Normally, great work and some knots that we all have ones we're super proud of and ones that didn't come out as good as we thought, but they're all important in the growth. Yeah. So um, absolutely like do a little research, read about, and on the producing side, like try to find information about how it came. Did somebody, did somebody find a book and take seven years for them to, to turn it into a script? Where did the idea come from? That's all stuff that you can do um, now with, with the internet and with the access to all this material. And you learn a lot of information from that. 
Those are great ideas. I'm imagining everyone in the audience is furiously scribbling them down right now. Um, but yeah, that's, that's so wonderful. And at this point, why don't we turn it over to audience questions? We received some in advance that I'll start with. And then for all of you out there in Zoom land, please feel free to write them down in the chat box and I'll scroll through them and, and pick them out. So the first question comes from Lily Windholtz from Colby College in Maine, who asks if there's anything you wish someone had told you when you first started your career. Hi, Lily, if you're here. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say it's a great question. Um, I'm lucky because I think a lot of people told me things that I needed, um, you know, and, and same with my parents, like they were always very supportive and calming. I, I think my advice would be, you know, be patient and don't put a ton of pressure on yourself. Don't put yourself in work environments that don't feel right. There's a lot of, you, if, if you're working for somebody and, and it doesn't feel like it's the right fit, either personality wise or you're not treated well, it's not going to, it's not going to change. And so really try to connect with people that you find inspiring um, on projects that you find inspiring. And look, one of the things about this industry in a bunch of different fields, if you're a cinematographer, an editor, or even a writer to a degree, sometimes you do have to make a living and you do have to, sometimes you have to work on things that aren't your ideal or dream project. And that's fine try to make it the best you can and get the most out of it. But I think that that too many people feel like they have to make some kind of personal sacrifice where they're in an environment where they're not really learning, they're not really having a good time. Um, and I, for me personally, I, there's a lot of people who have been successful that route. For me personally, I'm just so happy and fortunate that, that everybody that I've worked with, I feel like has taught me so much that I wouldn't change that. So I would say, be picky and realize that even if it's an industry that's tough to get into, you know, it's a two way thing. It, it, it should benefit at any level, whether it's the lowest level um, of a film set or, or working at an agency or anything to the highest level, you're, you're, you're spending your time and making sacrifices too. So make sure that's worth it. Yeah, definitely. And we have another question from someone who's wondering if it's possible to find summer internships with production companies. It is. Um, things have gotten a little trickier in the, over the last um, four or five years, but every, every studio and a lot of production companies have them. Most of the time you either need to be paid or you need to get um, school credit for it. So it's very helpful if that's another reason why it's good to be in school, because it actually opens doors for a lot of companies. You may not be able to do it if you don't. There has to be some kind of benefit that you're receiving. So it doesn't turn into taking advantage, which has happened a few times. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that 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 kind of goes back to what I said before. For that, I would I would look at production companies, like look at projects that you really enjoyed, or see who the studio was, see who the producer was. You know, there's there's probably four or five different sources um, on every project that that you can reach out to uh, and find the information to. So. Yeah, I would say reach out and, and ask. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, and we received another question in the chat box from audience member Rehan Call, who wants to know, when starting off as a producer, how do you gain credibility and access to start selling your work to studios and networks? That's a very good question and a very challenging one. I mean, it's hard. Uh, the truth is like, I, that's one of the benefits that I've had that I'm very grateful is Zach brings a level of credibility, um, you know, that I, that I don't have on my own and wouldn't have on my own. So um, it's, it, it really comes down to the material, you know, and if you're, if you have to have something of value. So if you find a script that a writer wrote that nobody's heard of, but the script is incredible, that's something valuable. You know, if you're tied to that, um, that brings you credibility. Your credibility really comes from first having something of value or, or working your way up where, where you have credibility from your job because you've worked up and people know you. And so you can gain credibility that way or you can gain, gain credibility by finding something great. And the reality is, unfortunately, you know, it's going to take time to prove that. And, and even, even um, recently on a lot of projects, we need partners because there's things we don't do. So I don't do, we don't do physical production yet. So we don't have like 
editorial and all that stuff. So we have partners and I've learned a ton. I used to be so scared of that question of like, you know, do I have credibility and always worried about, um, you know, does anybody like, am I taken seriously or, and the truth is you just have to start learning what you're good at. Um, and, and also, um, what you're not good at. And, and that's totally fine. I think for me, when I'm hiring or when I'm, um, the way people gain, gain credibility with me is when I trust them and I trust them, um, uh, that, that they know what they can do and they know what they can't do. And they're honest about that. So like something that's builds credibility with me is when somebody says, I don't know how to do this or, or I'm not the right person. I can do this. I'm confident in this, but like, we should find someone else for this. I do it all the time. Um, and so I think often when people are trying to prove that they deserve credibility or things like that, you, you lean into not wanting to be vulnerable, not wanting to um, admit that you don't know things or, or that maybe something's not your strength, but that's really where it comes from. And ultimately the strongest thing you have is confidence. You know, it, it really is. You just, the more problems you solve, the more comfortable you are when similar things come up. Because yeah. even though everything's different, there's patterns. And I think the the two things I would say about myself, why I think I've improved, maybe I'm, I would say I'm, I'm starting to hit my prime <laughs> is um, I'm learning how to learn a lot faster. So I'm, I'm learning how to, um, how to quickly um, learn how to deal with people, learn how to handle situations, um, learn how to do things. And, and that's a tough, you know, that's a hard thing to learn. And secondly, it's just, it, it's believing in yourself and, and just being comfortable and calm yeah. uh, when problems are, and that only comes with experience. Yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Another audience member, Maria Zanni writes, do you think there's enough content for the disabled community? I love what your production company stands for. And as a disabled creator, I want to bring stories into the mainstream. Uh, I, I don't think there's enough. I think that um, it's challenging. You know, I would say with diversity in all fronts, because uh, there's there's two types of diversity, I think, in, in creative stuff. But, you know, one is trying to tell stories with characters that are more diverse or more diverse stories where, where somebody like me is telling a story about someone else. And, and you know, that's helpful. And, and I think it, it's good. But what we really need is diversity in the voices that are telling the stories too. So, um, you know, one of the things that I learned from Down to Earth and that we're trying to do, hopefully, uh, if we do a season two, is if you're going you know, if you're, if you're doing something like in Australia or whatever, and you, there, there's a bunch of different indigenous communities. And, and in our minds, we might think that's a certain thing or think of it as one thing. And the instinct might be, oh, we should do an episode on the indigenous people. But when you think about it further, it, I think what you really want to do is how do we, how do we connect with as many different kinds of people as we can and have them involved in the storytelling? So, so, you know, asking them what story, rather than telling a story about them, asking some of these communities, and they're all different, what, what stories are important to you? What do you think the world needs to know? What do you want to tell? So it's, it's sharing, um, it, it's, it, it's passing the mic as much as you can. And that we're, you're limited by your own experiences. So the more you have the ability to, to have people with different experiences tell stories, you're going to get diversity in a different way so the answer is no i think that um i think that's probably across the board for for all all kinds of diversity and i think that um i'm glad that that people are trying to uh tell more stories and i think it's it's all of our responsibilities to to try to find those in storytellers not be the ones that are always have to be the ones to tell those stories so um yeah, it's, I, I think things are improving and, and it, um, I hope so. And, and I think it's only going to get better, but um, no, we're, we're, we're falling short and, um, and there's a lot of amazing voices out there that, that can tell stories that, that I know I can't.
Yeah, definitely. Um, another student wants to know if there are any great books or podcasts you could suggest to help students learn about the production side of the industry. Oh man, so I, I must admit, I might be one of the only people in the world that doesn't really um, listen to podcasts, but I, I should. You don't have um, time, you're too busy. No, it's definitely not that great thing to do. So I don't have much advice on the podcast, although I'm sure they're out there. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe we should do one through the uh, through you guys so we can, we can have something out there uh, specific. But I think um, there are a lot of great books. I would say, I think there's a few kinds of books I, I would read. One is just books about eras or about studios or things you're interested in. So um, there was a great book on like, I think it was called, uh, there was one like The Late Night Wars, which I read that's a while ago and uh, one about Disney. And you really just, you get to understand the workings of these big studios. And then autobiographies are always great. Yeah. So if you're into directors, there's tons of different ones. Um, Truffaut wrote, wrote a lot if you want to go uh, back like that or, or, or there's tons of uh, stuff now. And then I also, I like things with information. So I can't remember what it's called, but there's a handbook that's basically about um, entertainment law. Not that you're going to become a lawyer, but it gives you a general idea of what you're looking for. It was really helpful for me because at least when I'm on these calls, you know, I still refer to it sometimes. Um, and, and same with um, like production. There's like these big production handbooks, like almost like textbooks that take you through every department. So if you're not going to go to film school um, th and that's not an option for you, that's, that's a great way of learning what all the jobs are, what happens on set and things like that. But, but I always lean into personal stories. Like once again, find, just go around and look who's written autobiographies or who there's been biographies about that you feel like have the kind of career that you, that you're interested in. Um, because it's important to see and understand that path and see, you know, where things went well, where things didn't go well. Um, so yeah, that, that's what I would say on that. But with a little research, I, if you, if you connect me with that person, I'll make an actual list and, uh, and get it. But, uh, I have not read books about film for probably too long. Yeah. Well, we will get you in touch with that person. <laughs> Um, we have another question from someone who asks, what's the most challenging part of your job? The personal most challenging part is being away from the family when, when, um, when I'm traveling. Um, that, that's, that's, I would say, emotionally the toughest part. I think the toughest part for me in the actual job is what I talked about before, just constantly trying to be as much of a buffer as I can and be as much of a peacemaker as I can and really solve, solve as many problems as you can without alienating uh, people. I also think that's the most fun part of my job, but I think when I, when I'm the most stressed and I'm the most, when I, when I don't see the answer or I'm, or I know I, I'm not, I'm not doing it as well as I can, or I haven't figured out how I'm going to solve a problem. That's challenging. Um, I, I, it's really just the constant problem solving. But yeah, that 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 doesn't weigh on me that much. Sometimes it does. If there's conflict, I really don't like conflict. <laughs> um, so if there's something that I can't resolve, that that bothers me, um, and maybe makes me a little anxious, or you know, I can't sit down. I walk around a lot, but. I enjoy most of the challenges, so I wouldn't, yeah, I, I think a lot of the tougher stuff also comes as you're working your way up because you know you have good ideas, nobody's listening, or, you know, there's frust a lot of frustrations, but yeah, it gets, I don't want to say it gets easier, but the challenges don't feel, you don't feel the challenges in the same way. You learn to just have faith that the answers are coming and and not be stuck but the you know the hours are hard too and you're in shooting but but honestly there are so many departments that have such harder hours than i do and and are doing things physically harder and so i don't have anything to complain about then in that department so um yeah i 
it gets, it feels easier as you go. I don't know if it gets easier, but it feels easier. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, well, Michael, this has been really wonderful. And while I hate to say it, I think we're <laughs> just about out of time, but here's one last question to finish of off. If there's one thing you could tell students who are about to go into the world to look for a job in the midst of a deadly pandemic in a bitterly divided country, what words of wisdom would you give us? I mean, I, I would say that the strongest thing that you have is yourself and, and you have more control than you think. A lot of things are gonna happen around you that you don't have any control over, but what you do have control is to find opportunities in whatever happens. So, you know, I think in a lot of ways, there's a lot of sad stuff going on with how disconnected we all are. Try to try to connect people, you know, try to um, be empathetic, try to understand as many people as you can, even people that are different. Um, I think it just makes all of us stronger. From the work standpoint, realize that that even though it's an incredibly tough time, Thankfully, we are in an industry where a lot of people are looking for a lot of content. There's going to be a lot of opportunities. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a lot of amazing companies like Netflix. We've worked with them a few times. And it's been incredible. You know, Amazon, all the and new companies coming up and, and experiments happening, whether it's Quibi or other companies. And there's going to be great opportunities. So believe that your work has value. Um, you can't you can't control necessarily the pace of things or, or what's thrown at you, but you can be ready when the opportunities come. And so I think as tough as it is to not get down and frustrated with a lot of what's going on right now, you have control over, over yourself. And the more, the more prepared you can be, the better you'll be. But I would say there's going to be a lot of opportunities and, entertainment is not going anywhere. And as much as it changes, um, there's always gonna be room for storytellers and what we're all going through right now, I will never have the experience of being in college through a pandemic. You guys all do. You have access to stories and informations that information that I'll never have. I, I don't have parents that have different political views than mine or family members that, that are, you know, all of these things they're all stories. They're all experiences um, that make you unique, and that and that give you um, something that nobody else has. Whether it's your background or your experiences, good or bad, you know, a lot of amazing storytellers and stories have come out of struggles. So journal or look into those things and and. And look and see what you have. You have stuff of value and nobody else has your experience. So even when it gets bad, there's something there that that you have that nobody else has. Yeah. Well, I think that's a lovely and hopeful note to end our talk on. So in closing, I'd like to thank our lovely audience for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for coming. But most of all, thank you, Michael, for sharing your experience and expertise. I mean, your presence has meant so much to all of us at Brown and Ivy Film Festival, and we're so grateful for your time. Thank you. I'm sad you're graduating, but hopefully um, I'll be back because, uh, uh, yeah, you guys have always been great to me. You'll 100% be back, <laughs> hopefully in person when this pandemic Oh, is that'd be great. I miss it. It's so fun. <laughs> And uh, before signing off, I'd like to invite everyone to tune in tomorrow afternoon when we have more career chats. We'll have a workshop on film editing, plus a talk on screenwriting and podcasts. And we'll finish with a conversation on how to be a film critic and break into the world of film journalism. So we hope you'll pop over to our Facebook page and register for another event or two. And Michael, needless to say, we'll all be looking forward to seeing your next wonderful project with Zach or another segment of Down to Earth, hopefully season two. So until Fingers then, crossed. <laughs> we'll say a huge thank you um, and goodbye for now. Bye. Thank you. See you soon.